so thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief background to the project, where it is, just in case people don't know about it. Um, I've been involved since it was a twinkle in Philip Ashmole's eye, so probably about 1993, and um, was very instrumental in finding the site, which was a happy chance, and um, raising the money, which all came from private individuals and small trusts. It was none of it public money. And so uh, then we gained access in um, 20, in, in the year 2000. And uh, here's, here's our location map, just to remind people where it is. And um, did our first planting. Uh, this is a view of the valley um, in 96, absolutely scoured by ice. That's what we, we had. And scoured, of course, by ruminants, sheep and goats mostly here. So it was a typical Scottish upland pasture, bitten to the quick. And a picture of our, our Millennium Day planting when a hundred of us put a hundred trees into the ground, into this, this really compacted, very, very low grass sward with very, very low species diversity. So keep that image in your mind because I hope I'm going to show you some more interesting ones. Um, and here's one to just whet your appetite. Um, that is the valley before and the valley about a year ago, autumn 1919, 2019, um, when you, you see, sorry, quite a diversity um, of vegetation, the lushness of vegetation beginning to happen. It's spreading like a tide through the valley. The furthest extent of it that you see there is the last planted and also a less favourable aspect. So it will be more slow in developing, but it's all coming. It is very, very thrilling. Um, and to put this in a, a local geographical context, there's our site here in uh, marked in red and because I think of the success of it, um, other sites have been purchased. Now I should stress at this point that we, the Wildwood Group, did not actually buy Corifrin. We helped set up Borders Forest Trust, which um, was needed really as an umbrella organisation to, to embrace all sorts of interesting environmental projects in the borders and to try to attract some Millennium Forest for Scotland money. And so we joined in on that and got it set up and they became the owners of the, of the site. Uh, a few years later, they bought Core Head, which has got the Devil's Beef Tub in it as a farm, an upland farm. Um, and those two sites, Corifran and Core Head, are both about 1,600 acres. And then more latterly, they bought Taller and Games Hope, which um, is about double the size of those so that in, in total is about six and a half, sorry, 6,500 acres that have gone into environmental management. And when you consider it's also a National Trust property next door, there's actually a very large area that has tremendous potential for, for this interesting, rapid and rich change. And this black line that goes around the sites is um, SNH as was, is designation of, of wild land. So you can see that we're actually bang in the middle of it and comprise quite a lot of it. Um, that's our mission statement. Um, just to remind you that what we're interested in doing is getting this um, extensive tract of mainly forested wilderness with the rich diversity of native species before human activities became dominant. And we've never wanted to exploit it commercially, conscious that we need to manage the impact of people very carefully. And although we have open access completely and want it to be an educational resource, we don't, we've never wanted it to be on the tourist trail. And that's really quite important. Um, I've put this in to show you part of our attitude to climate change. I think this is the point at which I should explain that the way we operate is we, we are a pretty autonomous group within Borders Forest Trust. We've had a very um, dedicated group of people who've been involved over the years. And um, 
all policy is discussed at length and we get to a consensus about it. So we then go from recording, not just in the midst of recording in a policy document, which is meant to go forward into the future. And naturally, one of the things we have talked about is climate change. Though it's interesting seeing that mission statement that there's no mention there. 20 years ago, it didn't seem as urgent as we realize it is year on year now. So um, our, our discussions about climate change ranged around, should we, should we try and bring in some more southerly um, examples of, you know, the species that we've got, things that are grown elsewhere, um, should we change what we're planting? But no, we decided we would go with our basic idea, which was to pick up what was on the pollen chart. Sorry, I mustn't do that. Um, and um, hope that the sort of species that we've got, elm, oak, a bit of Scots pine, alder, birch, they all have a, a wide range of habitat and we hope that within that there is some resilience. Now we also hope that they will be resilient as the whole habitat is because relieved of grazing pressure and of other human pressure, um, it's likely to do better and, and that is what we're seeing happening is, is our environment is doing better. So saying we know there will be casualties. Yes, of course, we've got ash dieback. Everybody's got ash dieback. Um, we will watch those trees die. Very, very few of them will be removed. Um, if one or two are threatening people on paths, we might, but we don't have that many paths. So it will be a very small number. And of course, the the survivors, the, the trees that do come through, their seed is going to be so critical. But in the end, possibly a hopeful story because ash, when it does seed, it can grow like a weed. And let's hope that there will be new generations of, of resilient ash out there waiting to happen. We've also um, um, just accepted, somebody's offered to put in um, quite a lot of of witch elm that are, are bred to be Dutch elm resistant. So that's good. We've already got elm. We've, we've planted it in good faith and it's, so far it's doing fine, of course, because it's young. Now I'm just going to show you a range of pictures of, of the changing valley. So remember those, those bleak um, barren scenes that you saw to begin with. The, here's a picture of the valley uh, as it was looking a year ago um, and one with a, a closer view of, of rather larger woodland and this pretty picture of birch woodland and think of it as an impressionist painting because I, I nipped it from a website and it's a bit pixelated um, but when I was planting out um, honeysuckle under a canopy like this a few years ago now it's probably only about 2016 um, I found that the, the change in the soils was profound it, it so much leaf litter had fallen, even in that short time, that from a change from a compacted uh, sheep trodden sward, it, it was now quite loose, friable ground that I could I could actually plant the honeysuckles with my hands. I didn't need a trowel. Um, I can remember that being amazing to me and to other people, but it was true. Um, our resident ecologist, well, our, our steering group ecologist, Stuart Adair, was very concerned that the, um, the sort of coarse grasses of the, the upper land here would take over and uh, that we wouldn't see much diversity up there. But to everybody's delight, particularly his, we've, we've found that instead of Nardus and, and that tribe, we're getting um, a, a lot of, of heather and blaeberry and other heath plants and of course that's a much more open sward and things can seed into them and indeed the the little rowans that were always there and always bitten back are, are beginning to become small trees even up quite high this is quite quite high in the valley the the heather line used to be like a tide line on a bath and now it's becoming it's coming right down the scree it's a it's a rapidly changing environment that is getting richer year on year um, here's an example of what happens when you take grazing pressure away. This is one of the very few ivies left in the valley 
Um, and just less than 10 years later, that's what it looked like because the goats hadn't been getting at it. Um, and the others are doing just as well. Here's a, a picture from last, late last summer, just showing the sheer lushness of stuff. You, you don't see grassland with heather like that in many places in Scotland because there's always grazers, there's always deer. Um, the next picture is slightly self-indulgent with my grandchildren, but just as they're growing lustily, so our, um, our, our, sorry, our tall herb communities have been quite amazing. All of the, the lowland, the low valley areas are covered with um, a mixture that, of meadowsweet, knapweed, yes, angelica late in the summer, masses and masses of things, um, just all doing so well. And here's, here's another story. Um, species like um, sea campion that we thought were just going to be confined to cliffs. They must have been seeding down into the burns year on year, you know, for forever and never managing to establish themselves lower down. But now they're popping up everywhere. They're popping up um, on, on scree on the valley sides, particularly beside the burn. And um, Here's a lovely example of the confluence of our two burns in the valley. Um, a sort of sh shaly, shingly island has built up, um, caused by a flood about 15 years ago, I think. And very rapidly, it became colonised by all sorts of plants. Um, mountain sorrel, you can see there, the sea campion, there's, there's some saxifrage somewhere in the picture. And um, lots and lots of different plants. and which we again we just didn't think we would see um, and until in the last year or two they've almost been crowded out by things like um, woodrush, lazula but that that of course will change this is an, a dynamic environment because flooding will stir up those stones again and and probably knock some of the plants out new seeding will occur and we'll, we'll get a cycle of, of blooming I think and whilst we've got the picture of the bluebell up that's another interesting success story because there were a few on some bits of the grassland but they they're appearing all over the valley and we're really not very sure whether they've spread been spread their seeds by birds or something or whether they were just suppressed and there but um, they don't need any intervention they're just happening and then the bogs and mires for which our site had its triple s egg SI designation, we were worried about them because we thought we might be um, not helping the species that they were de designated for. But in fact, they've done extraordinarily well. I mean, look at these lusty pictures, the, the lusty flowers, um, all looking beautiful and doing very, very well indeed. And things like bog asphodel, which is not shown, are as well. And then on the valley slopes, other communities, again, I borrowed these pictures from the website, so they're not very clear, but um, it shows you just the, sh the sheer beauty of what's going on in summer, all sorts of things that um, are, well, they're all familiar, but they're all doing better than they are anywhere else. And then we have intervened um, to bring in some species that uh, we felt should be there and, and bearberry was one that is around in the southern uplands but wasn't in this valley so we've we got some from appropriate sites um, it was grown on from cuttings and this is a picture of volunteers planting it and one of our high camps right up on rotten bottom which is our our major um, peat bog and I should say at this stage that we have done a, a modicum of peat bog restoration. Actually, on, on Rotten Bottom, we advised that we didn't need to do anything except um, withdraw the grazing and that it would heal itself. And that is happening and the bearberry is helping. But on an, another site, um, a high clue, a high gully, um, we have put in various forms of matting and some dams to slow water down and, and we've seen wonderful growth of a sort of um, the montane meadow with globe flower and um, magnificent sphagnum moss and things it's it's a very healthy environment and then the insect populations um, we've been monitoring 
we're monitoring obviously the vegetation from the start the, the insects have been monitored by various people and doing very well tiger moths used to be common in my childhood hadn't seen one for years but they're they're back with us and this was a surprise this was high up on that um, montane vegetation a um, a high flyer moth caterpillar eating our salix opponum our, our downy willow but um, a nice surprise a uh, lovely surprise too when we saw the stripy um, jumpers of, of um, cinnabar moth caterpillars on um, on ragwort that's they've appeared suddenly Dennis the menace this one was uh, um, an ornithologist I'm oh, sorry <laughs> an entomologist found uh, it's a bug unknown um, in Scotland until now but it, it's um, it's with us in Carifron. Um the Scotch Argus is doing very nicely thank you lots of those in the late summer and plenty of fritillaries including the small pearl bordered so we've got all these we've got you know masses more plants masses more insects and every tree has got something eating it and so of course we've got a changed bird population um this seems to have slipped sorry i i can't correct that where that is the top line is the meadow pipit and the, the bottom one is general woodland species the the meadow pipits start amazingly abundant and they do slightly decline because we're we're destroying some of their habitat but oh boy they've got plenty outside the valley so we're not too worried about them at the beginning of the monitoring which was right back in the year 2000 and was done by peter gordon of rspb there were i think two woodland species um uh, one was a chaffinch but i can't remember what the other one was um and about three individuals in all very very low count and by about 2008 we saw this begin to change where um black cat red pole um and a lot more birds woodland birds common woodland birds in other places but they've come in and their numbers are growing year on year these have been fantastically well recorded by um one of the members of our group called john savory who alas died earlier this year but has left us a, a brilliant legacy he he monitored our valley annually, and i think the the Valley of Black Hope, which is side by side with us um, every other year, so that we've got a, a, a comparison, and um, has, has monitored these changes and written it up. And we think it's probably the only example of, of such a record um, that exists. So it's it's a useful resource for people. Uh, it was fully written up in Bird Life or something a couple of years ago. Um, the it, it's also on our on the Borders Forest web. So, or Borders Forest Trust website. Um, then some, we're grateful to Richard Clarkson, who was the warden at um, Grey Mess Tale for these. These are last summer's pictures of a black cat singing and um, a goshawk, which was a first record for us. I had a nice raptor sighting myself about a month ago when I was out with some archaeologists looking at our scheduled monuments and saw a a buzzard being mobbed and when I looked closely it was being mobbed by a pair of merlin which was not the first sighting but quite a thrilling one so things are changing um, I think that we do offer an example of rich nature and something that can come back so quickly um, when you do the right things when you when you do really remove the grazing when you minimize human contact in every way uh, stand back and wait to see what happens that um, we hope to inspire other people to do the same sort of thing thank you